Are people in the carnivore and keto community going too far? What is going on with all this extremism? Let's talk about it. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today I have more of the conversation that I had with Rob Wolf not so long ago on my podcast. Now, as I mentioned in a previous episode, I'm not going to be posting the entire episode here on YouTube because I don't want to lose my platform. So about the last half hour of this conversation is missing. And if you want to listen to that, then you'll need to go to my podcast, which is linked in the information section of this video. So make sure if you want to hear the whole thing, you head on over there. But in this conversation, we talked about all the extreme people in this space and viewpoints in this space. Is it helpful? Is it harmful? Let's talk about the protein sparing, modified fasting, high protein, PUFAs, the need for fruit, the need for sugar, and the whole metabolic flexibility debate. So, so much valuable information here in this conversation. And, you know, I really enjoyed it because I am getting further and further away from just being involved in dogma as much as possible. I really want to keep my platform as a resource for people so that they can find what works best for them. We don't win any awards for subscribing to a particular philosophy if that philosophy does not work for us, if it's not serving us any further. And so I feel like Rob Wolf does just an amazing job here on this episode of diving into those topics and really talking about those things. I want to pause and thank the sponsor of today's video, which is Let's Get Checked. Now you guys know Let's Get Checked is my absolute favorite resource for getting my blood work done at home. I just sent off my vitamin D yesterday to do a recheck. I'm, te I'm checking my vitamin D every four to six weeks just to see if what I am doing is going to help me maintain those really good high levels without supplementation. So you know that my motto here on this channel is always test and don't guess. So if you wanna check your vitamin D, your CRP, your A1C, your cholesterol, your sex hormones, your thyroid hormones, a full panel, you can use Let's Get Checked. Check those things from home and use my code YOGI30 to save 30% off of those tests. Follow the link in the information section. And like I said, test don't guess. Thanks again to Let's Get Checked for sponsoring today's video. Let's get right into it. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back and tuning into this week's episode. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to have Rob Wolf here on the show with me. Rob, thank you so much for being here. Huge honor to be here. Thank you. Oh, you're so kind. Um, I'm a big fan of followed your work for many years and, uh, you know, appreciate all the information you've put out in the past and continue to put out. And I just love your, your non-dogmatic approach to, to health in general. Thank you. It, uh, I, it, it's funny. It won't fill up your Twitter and Instagram profile as quickly as being a zealot, but I feel like it keeps me like, the other stuff just gets exhausting, like trying to figure out the next better mousetrap and what hyperbole to one up whatever extremism somebody else has done. So, so thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, this year I've kind of been looking at, we, I said, we'll talk about censorship a little bit later, but I've been like wondering why my profile and everything hasn't been growing as much. And I think it's because I kind of took a, a hard stop at the beginning of the year and said, here's some stuff going on in carnivore keto and problems that we're having. And I've kind of been the one with a voice about, let's talk about some of these problems that people are experiencing. And I think that that kind of stopped my page from oh, growing very, so quickly. <laughs> very unpopular pointing out that carnivore and keto, although awesome interventions may not be the sole intervention for everybody. That's very unpopular. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so it hasn't been like the feel good carnivore page, but I think people at the end of the day, like I have with your work, appreciate when you spot something and say, let's talk about this instead. Let's, instead of like, let's brush it under the rug and continue like kind of being, like you said, like a zealot, 
let's have a conversation about it and see if we, and, and I find uh, that if we start to have conversations about things, more people come in, more ideas come in and there are solutions. And I still do eat a primarily carnivore diet, even though I've had run into some things that just required some tweaking. Right. 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 Yeah. 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 You know, and it, it's funny. I, I arrived at this in part due to experimenting with a vegan diet and getting very, very sick from that. And there was a bunch of other stuff. I was in a graduate program. I was sleeping three hours a night. I lived in Seattle and I hadn't seen the sun in three years. Vitamin D wasn't even on my, my radar. I think the first time I got my vitamin D checked around that time, it was 11 or something wow. like that. I mean, it, it just, so it, you know, blaming it solely on a vegan diet is, is disingenuous and dishonest, but it clearly also wasn't serving me particularly well. But when I talked to the luminaries in the vegan scene at that time, they made that failure, my fault, not a potential incompatibility with, with the dietary approach that I, I was tinkering with. And again, like I, you can't find somebody more excited about carnivore and, and keto and paleo than me, but I also recognize that God damn it, it. It just doesn't work exactly the way that we would like it to work for everybody. And that's not that person's fault. That is the limitation of the template that we have, but usually shuffling that template to some degree, we can start making it work for the person. Maybe they need some starch. Maybe they need some fruit. Maybe they need to avoid dairy, you know? And I mean, um, religious wars are fought along each one of those lines instead of just trying to help people find what's going to work for them individually. Yeah. 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 I'm a big believer in just finding what works for you individually. And I've had this year to really kind of work on my gut. And then the vitamin D thing has been huge for me this year. Um, I, I had like a level of like a 33 at the beginning of the summer and now it's up to a 60. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. I've dropped weight. I've got a nice tan. Um, <laughs> I've, but I've changed a lot, you know, just my relationship with light. It's not just laying out in the sun. It's getting morning sunlight and yep. reducing EMF. I mean, I was outside working on my laptop for about two hours before I finally came in the office to record. I haven't gotten my uh, nice. recording studio outdoors just yet, <laughs> right. but that's a goal, but you know, if we sit here and we just are focused so much on the food constantly, we're going to miss the boat on so many other things. It's like yep. if people are glued to their devices all day and l watching the news and, and not getting any sunlight exposure, not sleeping. Yeah. The diet's not going to really work so well for you. It might save your life. It might keep you from, from demise a little bit quicker, but it's still not going to do what you want it to do. Yeah. We're still yeah. not living the way that we really need to live to be optimized for sure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, well, I wanted to jump into, I guess, some of the, the trends that are going on a little bit right now that I'm seeing It's in the carnivore community a lot. Um, and then keto is kind of swinging that way as well of just uh, protein sparing modified fasting and the super high protein going super lean and really limiting your fat. And I'm just curious to know what your take on all of that is, what you're seeing. I know you have a group um, on the mighty with a lot of people. And so you, you're, I always value opinions of people who are like working with people, talking with people on a daily basis. So what are your, <laughs> I know that's a loaded question. No, 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 it's great. Uh, uh, it, it's interesting when we run these, so part of the healthy rebellion, we have these three, four times a year resets where people work on sleep, food, movement, and community. It's basically the four pillars that I, I pulled out of wired to eat. And it's, it's, uh, we really lean heavily on that work to kind of guide what we're, we're doing there. And we'll have folks that have followed my work for eight, 10 plus years. And they're like, you know, it really helped me, but I still have these challenges with body composition in particular. Like mm -hmm. I, I would, maybe we'll focus on that yeah. specifically, but uh, I've historically not been a huge fan of weighing and measuring of food. I don't know if it's being a biochemist in training and weighing and measuring everything in my life, you know, for years in a lab. And I'm like, God, I'm, I'm done with it. And also when we ran our, our CrossFit facility way back in the day, the only time that I saw women in particular develop disordered eating was the weighing and measuring of food. And that was something mm. that was cool about kind of a basic paleo template plus CrossFit. If we got people excited about performance and then let the body composition do what it's going to do, I never saw disordered eating. So it was some really cool stuff with that. But all that said, 
when we do these resets and people are struggling with body composition, inevitably what we find is that these folks are under eating protein. Like, mm -hmm. And it, it's just, I've never seen somebody who had body composition goals that were unmet that was eating adequate protein. And sometimes it was like 25 to 50% under what they were supposed to be eating. And uh, there was a, a period of time when keto land was super fat centric. And you had these groups of people that were more afraid of mTOR and insulin like growth factor than the vegans were. And there were yes. people in, in keto land that were recommending like 35, 40 grams of protein per day total. And the funny thing about that, there's this crazy guy on the internet, Darian Ryder, who, who oh, recommends yeah. 30, 30 bananas a day. Right. The funny thing is if you eat 30 bananas a day, a day, you get about 35 to 40 grams of protein. So the, the, the these keto folks were recommending something wow. that was as insane as a 30 banana a day diet, you know? And, and I think that for some folks, you know, if they're shifting from a standard American diet and there's tons of processed, uh, carbs, that might have been beneficial in the initial weeks, maybe even months. But then over the course of time, they started doing seeing like GI problems and, and loss of muscle mass and gaining body fat on a diet that ostensibly is supposed to be impossible to, to gain body fat on. Although I am not, I, I was once a, a, an adherent of the insulin hypothesis. I no longer really am. I think it's both hormones and Calories, yeah. funny enough, I think that they're both really, really important. So I think that there's been a, a really important shift into this kind of protein centric model. And when we think about things like the protein leverage hypothesis that suggests that most organisms eat to a protein minimum and that that's really what their body is assessing because most protein rich foods are also very nutrient dense. So it's kind of a a way to aggregate information. If you get enough protein in general, you, you ticked all the boxes of all the other nutrients that you need. And then once the person eats adequate protein, they stop eating generally. And if one does not eat adequate protein, then they continue eating, whether that's fat or carbs. And, and, and just over the course of time, we've just seen that work really, really well. And this is a stretch. And I don't know that it's the best analogy, but in my mind, it makes a lot of sense, but I see the management of type one diabetes as being one of the most challenging kind of metabolic problems to deal with. Like it's really, really hard to not kill these people either with high blood sugar or low blood sugar standard of care management is kind of eat whatever carbs you want, and then we'll cover it with insulin. And now most type one diabetics end up being type two diabetic also due to the type of care that they have and the best management of type one diabetes that we've, we've seen, there was a Harvard back study that looked at the Bernstein, uh, diabetes solution intervention, which is basically a high protein, moderate fat, low carb intervention. So the goal isn't specifically ketosis. The goal is super stable, normalized blood sugars. Mm. And it looks very similar to what my friends at keto gains do with their program. It looks real similar to kind of a a modified carnivore diet. So I don't know if it's confirmation bias or we're actually just seeing stuff that works and you, you kind of see people moving in that direction. And I, I would be more concerned about folks doing these PSMFs and, and stuff like that, and maybe overdoing the protein, but we have a few, more than a few, actually a good number of them, protein overfeeding studies where they tried to overfeed folks protein and people just can't do it long-term. Like they yep. just refuse to eat. They stop eating the protein. They kind of, they bring their caloric load back down to normal levels. So I would be inclined to say that the protein could be driven overboard, similar to eat all the fat or, mm -hmm. or you know, eat all the carbs or whatnot. And I'll, I'll reserve my right to amend my, my, you know, opinion later, but it <laughs> looks like it's just less, it looks less dangerous to overdo protein relative to underdoing it for sure. And that was like the longest answer to the simplest question ever asked, but that that's what I've got. No, there's so much in there that I, I just love. And, you know, I feel like some of the, one of the things that I see a lot, and I know you've seen a lot in trends over the years is that there's kind of this like bell curve of, of things. And I see 
people like me, I'm an extreme person. If you tell me fasting is good, then I want to do like a seven day water fast. You know, right. if protein is good, then I want to eat like 400 grams a day. And a lot, I think a lot of people that are attracted to carnivore that are attracted to these different types of, of ways of eating are on kind of similar to me where they tend to just really overdo things. And so you know, for me, and I, it was before protein sparing modified fast was even like a, a big thing in, I mean, Lyle McDonald did that years ago. Um, but now it's, uh, people have brought it back out. There's books and, you know, a whole, there's a lot just over the last year, but I did this like back in 2019. Right. And, uh, I was like, oh, I'm just not really losing the weight that I want to lose. And, um, what took my protein way up, and I think it was too high. And I see this happen quite a bit that it made me more hungry. Yep. Um, it made my blood sugar run higher. And then when I got lab work done, my um, bun creatinine ratio was showed that I was just severely dehydrated. And so it was in my G EGFR, which is estimated, right? it was down to like a 69 or something like that. And I was like, crap, that's probably not good. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wonder, you know, if there can't the, the dark side a little bit of all this protein loading, that was the dark side for me. I wonder yeah. how common that is. Do you ever see that? Or do you, do you think that that's becoming an issue? It, it, it could in some folks, and it is worth mentioning as much as I'm, I'm singing the virtues of like the, the, uh, the satiety, you know, benefits of, of protein and the protein leverage hypothesis and all that type of stuff. There is kind of an S curve where amount of protein relative to, to, uh, satiety, you hit a point where satiety is maximum, you know, kind of maximizing it somewhere around like a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass up mm. to a gram of protein of, of body weight. And then when you go beyond that, then it, it's, profoundly stimulates appetite. And I think part of the mechanism there is that there is kind of a reality humans plateau out at somewhere between 30 and 40% of protein as a, a macronutrient. That's the most that they can really process. We need some carbs or some fat as a cofactor. If you get right. much beyond that, uh, just because of the, the nitrogen, um, you know, detox, uh, uh needs of the liver. And so if we're really hammering protein and we go beyond that, that level as a percentage of calories and the person is already lean. So this is where somebody can be, if they're significantly overweight, they could be on some sort of a, a PSMF for a long time because they can pull body fat to act as that, right. that cofactor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it definitely could be over overdone. It, it definitely can be overdone. And, and this is a, a very <laughs> typical result is that people will find that they will overeat and then they end up with some, like some electrolyte imbalances and stuff like that, because they've gone way above and beyond what a, a normal physiological intake should be for a, a protracted period of time. Yep. So you think like, cause I was definitely exceeding a, you know, a gram per pound of body weight, not even lean body mass, but a, a gram right. per pound of body weight. I was far exceeding that. And cause I just thought, yeah, protein's good. <laughs> lean is good. That's what I'm going for. And I think I was running, you know, just all the time in gluconeogenesis, just constantly. I didn't have carbs. I didn't have, I really didn't have enough fat to really mm -hmm fuel myself adequately. And yeah, I ended up feeling bad and starting to have sleep problems and hormonal problems. And so I always like with all the stuff going on with like the super high protein, I think there's definitely positive things about it. But then I remember kind of my experience with it. And I'm like, I'm, I know there's so many people out there that are kind of extreme the way that I am. And so <laughs> I try to, I'm like, Oh, uh, I just kind of want to see how this is going to go for people. I want people to be successful and, and find what works best for them. But I'm like, yeah, I'm hoping that it, you know, people can understand that there isn't all, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. If you just right. keep doing one thing and keep doing it more and more. Right. And, it, and it's a tough one when you're thinking about this from like a coaching perspective, or even like pulling back, like more of a public health recommendation, I would still say that by and large people at a population level are under eating protein. Oh, and big this time. may be a major time. driver of like obesity writ large. 
but then how do you keep it? It's almost uh, using a microscope and like dialing in versus pulling back, like really, really detailed versus big picture. A big picture story is that people are probably under eating protein in general and dense, you know, nutrient dense protein sources in particular. But then at an individual level, we have folks like yourself and myself that will take things to, you know, the nth degree. And then that ends up being a problem too. I, I will say that I, I, because of, I, I have real nervousness around like, uh, capacity issues within our healthcare system and stuff like yeah. that, that I tend to say, well, I guess you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet. And so some of the extreme people that take this stuff too far, that's super unfortunate, but those aren't the folks you and I are not going to be the people that no. cripple Western healthcare systems due to <laughs> no. diabetes, you know? So, so it sucks, but I think that this is that other piece of this where we do need to be aware of it. People like you need to have this message out there so that the folks bouncing around, they're like, well, I'm eating all this protein and I'm having these problems. There needs to be a voice so that they can hear that, but it's almost like we have to kind of whisper that on the side yeah. so that we keep the, the masses, like they're not reading the eat Lancet stuff that you should get like 14 grams oh. of protein per day. And it, it you know, e even the, the rebuttals about the eat Lancet material at the world health organization level suggested that we will see wanton nutrient deficiencies because of the, the decrease in, in the already paltry amounts of animal protein. And we will see enhanced obesity because people will eat more because of that protein leverage hypothesis. Yeah. Thing. So yeah, it, it, but it's, it's tough. You have to keep both of these truths in your head at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive and it depends where, where one is in that story that you have to apply this part of the story versus that part of the story. Yeah. I'm realizing that the more and more that I kind of hang that this community is small, but it seems really big when you're in the middle of it. You know, it seems right. like there's so many people when you're kind of in the middle of it, because all day people are messaging me about carnivore or doing low carb keto. And, you know, so you just kind of think, well, everyone is, is like that. But right. I mean, all I have to do is go and spend time with my extended family. And they, I mean, I might as well just be wearing a tinfoil hat when it comes to talk. Right. Well, I'm talking about, I was going to say food, but it's like talking about everything at this point in my life. I just, right. I'm like, I'm not gonna, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. So I I completely understand that, and I've talked with Dr. Ken Barry before, and you know what he what his message is because there was this whole thing about poofas last year. It's it's so funny how these controversies like right now it's like everyone's all piece, you know protein sparing and high protein. Last year everyone was flipping out about poofas. Don't eat and, pork. Don't eat oh pork. Oh my God. Don't eat pork and don't eat salmon and don't eat, you know. And so I had Dr. Barry on and we were talking a little bit before we did that interview last summer. And he's like, you know, my message, the people I'm talking to are the people of Walmart, you know, the people of the country who, like you were saying, are going to cripple the medical system. And you know, we, when we're kind of doing this, like, and there's more stuff, you know, like this infighting type of thing, um, it's not helping to get that message out to more people. Um, and I do, I do feel like sometimes it's like, we, we think that everyone is like us. We think everyone's in a healthy weight and has time to work out and looks at the sun and does all these things, but the rest of the world has no clue at all. And so there's, it's kind of this balancing game, like you were saying, kind of whispering it out to the people that need to hear it, but it doesn't need to be kind of shouted out on the rooftops to the rest of the world. Cause you know, they're, they're, they're not even, you know, open to hearing that meat is the most healthy thing you could be eating, you know, the most right. nutrient dense thing you could be eating. Yeah. I, I did some interesting work for the Chickasaw nation a couple of years ago and it kind of a global um, health initiative that they wanted to roll out to all of their, their tribe, all of their people, but they were really focusing heavily on their casino workers because mm. these folks get really, really sick. There's a lot of night shift, oh, yeah. um, terrible, terrible food options. Uh, the circadian rhythm disruptions are really gnarly. So I wrote a guide around that. that was just super simple. Like it, it is more that kind of, you know, like I, I don't shop at Whole Foods. I shop at Walmart. And so what, right. and, and I have three kids and I'm a single mom and like, how do I navigate all this stuff? You know, and yeah. it, it was super simple. It was like, 
focus on more protein. When you're drinking a beverage, make it coffee, tea, water, ideally unsweetened. If you do sweeten it, use an artificial sweetener, not, yeah. not fructose. And it, you know, and this is, yeah. there's all these trigger things, but they, they rolled this out to their staff and they're like, this was really simple. And like, they, they checked metabolic markers on these folks at, at, at three and six month intervals and people got healthier. Like they got markedly healthier, you know, drinking artificial sweetened colas instead of sugared colas and getting, you, you know, leaving one part of the bun off instead of eating the whole bun, instead of doing fries, doing a side salad, you know, there were just some, some yeah. little things like that, that they, they did that had really, really profound benefit, but folks in our community would freak out. They're like, well, they're drinking aspartame and mm -hmm. that's going to kill you. And yeah. Uh, you know, the meat wasn't grass fed and oh my God, gluten and, 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 you know, just layer after layer. Whereas for those folks, maybe someday those folks will, will have enough of a health change that they're like, I feel better, but I think I could get more. And then maybe they get more nuanced, but that, that triage, like that first level, I see what most people are doing in the health space as focusing on dripping faucets, but the house is burning down and yeah. they're literally like, can't focus on the dripping faucet enough while the house around them is burning down. Whereas I, I think what you and I are talking about is maybe we should prevent the house from burning down and, yeah. and then attend to the dripping faucet when and where we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I talked with uh, Amy Berger, um, you know, and her, she's working with Dr. Westman now and, and they are okay with people having seed oils, you know, yeah. and we're in the keto world and carnivore world banging the drum of how horrible these seed oils are. And I'll have Kate Shanahan on a future podcast episode. I've got her scheduled to talk about all this stuff because it's interesting to our community, but it's like, it, you know, we would rather them just get off of the sugar, get off of the processed foods. And if they need to have some salad dressing with a little bit of seed oil in it to get them over to the other side, you know, they're okay with it. I read in your carb confusion, their book, uh, before I interviewed Amy and I was like, interesting. And at first, of course, you know, I'm in my little bubble over here. I'm like, oh, but they're saying seed oils are okay. But now sitting back a little bit and having more of a global view, it's like, yeah, that's better than, you know, ice cream or a cola right. or it's as, it, way better. Yeah. And, you know, as an aside, if there were one person that I know that I would elect as global leader to be in charge of everything, it'd be Amy Berger. Like <laughs> I, I, she's the only person I know who is sane enough and balanced enough and, and conscientious enough that she wouldn't fuck that job up. So, yeah. so Amy yeah. Berger for global leader. She yeah. would definitely have my vote. She, yeah. she would. I really enjoyed talking with her. Just very, just level-headed, you know, her whole thing is keto without the crazy. And I think yeah. that that is, it's needed. And, you know, she isn't viral. She doesn't have a hundred thousand YouTube subscribers. She doesn't have the huge following. And, um, it says, you know, it says a lot about her that she's not trying to do that. It's, she just wants to truly help people. And, I feel like we need a little bit more of that, even though it's not glamorous, it's not popular um, to have discussions that are going to help more people, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we, we kind of open with this a little bit, but the, the seed oil thing in, in my mind or the PUFA, you know, like don't eat pork because of PUFAs and everything. I see that as this revolving door of folks looking around and trying to figure out how do I distinguish myself from everybody yeah. else? So how do I... How do I get that virality around my, my, my cause and doing super extreme positions on topics. And this is what's so just screwed up about our, our moment in history right now, the Facebook algorithms, human nature just gravitates towards that extremism, mm -hmm. the, this uh, certitude. Also people love certitude and, yes. um, and man, there's not a better way of screwing up a lot of people than throwing yeah. out these certitude and, and, you know, these, the taking these super nuanced spots and making them the, the most important thing, you know, again, you have these most of, of, you, let's just talk about the United States, you know, you have so many of these people that are like split families, they're living paycheck to paycheck. They want to do better for themselves and their family, but they've you've only got so much bandwidth. Yes. Like a, I, I forget what the number is, but um, 
most people have made so many decisions by noon in their life, like major decisions that they're done. They're just done. They don't want to make any more decisions. They don't want to have to think about anything else. And suggesting that, you know, getting a burger minus the bun with some cheese on it and, and having a side salad with a little bit of canola oil in it is, is like the worst thing that you could possibly do. And you're not eating the bun. You're not eating the fries. You're not drinking a sugary beverage, right? Your total caloric load is like four or 500 calories versus 1500 calories in a single meal. And that's not a fucking win. It's like, give me a break, you know? And, but this is, this is the messaging that is really winning right now. And I don't know how, or if that will change. I, I kind of see it as, as like waves breaking on the beach. Like people run into that and then they kind of retreat back and they're like, okay, this is kind of insane. The unfortunate thing is I, I think that people retreat out of it entirely. They're like, that didn't work. That was over the top because they forget that there's this whole middle ground there, you know, yeah. within the, the success of keto and carnivore there's this whole world of like low carb. Yeah, you know? exactly. Instead of eating 500 grams of carbs a day, maybe eat a hundred or even 150. And that works right. great for you. And it's like, awesome, but you don't fit into any camp. You're not yeah. any type of an extremist, even eating that way daily among office workers, you wouldn't even really stand out other than like, Oh, Charlie eats pretty well. You know, he's the weirdo yeah. that eats pretty well, but he's not keto. He's not carnivore. He's right. not any of you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's been a tough thing for me this year because I did super strict carnivore for two years. And then this year I started kind of diving into microbiome and just curious, like how much is my gut actually healed? Can I handle different things? And, you know, started playing around with adding in like Brussels sprouts or asparagus or little things here and there. And I talked about it and I got all these people, well, I guess you're not carnivore yogi anymore. I guess you're gonna have to change your name. And I'm like, do I? Because really what I stand for, if you know me, if you follow me is just challenging the norm. My whole thing is like, let's challenge the idea that you have to be a vegan to be a yoga teacher. Let's let's just like, that's what the name stands for. It's not so much about, fitting into a diet camp. And if you want to do carnivore for 10, 12, 20 years, the rest of your life, cool. But most people don't, you know, most people aren't going to want to stay on a carnivore diet for the rest of their lives. I like to have a salad. If I'm going out to a nice steak restaurant, that's a treat to me. And that may sound like, you know, blasphemy <laughs> to some of the carnivore people, but I do enjoy a nice restaurant salad. It's probably got seed oils in it. Now that I think about it, it's delicious at a nice steakhouse. Um, but it's not the norm for me, but if I want to do that, I'll do that. And I will be honest with people that follow me that my gut has healed. I've done a lot of, to work on it and now I can tolerate some things, but that doesn't make it like my lifestyle unhealthy. It doesn't make right. me less of a carnivore, less, you know, it, it's, it's just crazy how we've kind of turned into vegans a little bit. It, it's embarrassing. And it, at the early iterations of carnivore, I would frequently admonish people. I'm like, Hey, let's just not take this to a spot where we look crazier than the raw vegans. And, yeah. and we've done that. In many it's, ways. There. <laughs> yeah, it's there. Yeah. We yeah. have arrived. Yeah. 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 And I actually wanted to ask you kind of on that topic of the whole me- metabolic flexibility thing, because that's a huge topic right now as well. And um, I've definitely played around a little bit to see how well my blood sugar does to add a, a little thing here and there and, and check in with that. And at first it was bad. Like my blood, sh- I couldn't handle adding in anything. Mm-hmm. Now that I've practiced it for a while, I'm good at it. I'm fine. And I feel actually feel better for it. But um you know, what's your take on the whole metabolic flexibility thing? Oh man, it's, it's a funny story. Um, it was maybe six years ago, might even been seven years ago. Think about this, maybe six years ago. Uh, the, I really, I had the concept of metabolic flexibility had been on my radar, but I, I did a talk three or four years ago called metabolic flexibility, the Rosetta stone of the macronutrient wars, you know, and it, 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 I think one of my, my better talks and it kind of got in and looked at like, well, there's these laudable characteristics to a 
whole food based, you know, higher carb diet, you know, we see this at a population level, there's clearly, you know, benefits in different circumstances with lower carb going into ketosis and even fasting and, and all this. And, uh, as I really started digging into things, it was like, oh, metabolic flexibility, that's what you really want. And a lot of it, uh, uh, came about looking at my wife, like when we did the blood sugar testing for wired to eat, because I have this seven day carb test as, as part of the book. Oh Yeah. Nikki would eat 50 grams of carbs from rice and I would eat it. And she's 40 pounds lighter than I am. Her blood sugar would top off at like 110. Mine would go to 190. Wow. You know, and just the fact that I'm bigger than her, I, I should have had lower blood sugar. Like if I had eaten an amount of carbs commensurate to my body weight, like yeah. I would have been unconscious, you know? And it's funny, Nikki will eat keto and she'll go in and out of ketosis and she doesn't even notice it. She has no mental fatigue. She has no de decline in physical performance. She is super metabolically flexible. And I think in general, that's kind of like the ideal for most people yeah. to be at. You could eat carbs. You could not eat carbs, you know, and, it, and it's not a big deal. I don't know if at a population level, there's just some people that are less metabolically flexible. Yeah. I don't know if like some epigenetic things have happened. Like I was on tetracycline for acne between the ages of, of like 13 and 21. And, and I had so many sinus infections as a kid and like mm -hmm. on and on and on. I don't know if my gut is just so hammered that, you know, I'm, I'm never going to have the, the type of metabolic flexibility that I would like, but it, it, it metabolic flexibility for me is this really interesting thing. I was going to orient my whole future career around this. It was like, I, I was spinning up this, uh, Metflex certification. We were going to certify metabolic flexibility specialists. But as I started digging into this more and more, I was like, I don't know how to achieve this. Like mm. we get people lean that generally improves metabolic flexibility. If we can improve gut health, that generally improves metabolic flexibility, but it doesn't always. And, and just being leaner doesn't always improve metabolic flexibility. Sometimes fasting can help, but it doesn't always, you know? Right. And, and so it became this thing where it's like, yeah, you really want metabolic flexibility, but I can't think of a really ironclad consistent way of producing it, you know, in some situations, yes. And we can kind of squeeze the margin out a little bit, but it became this thing where what I realized it was that I was going to have to tell a boatload of lies in order to sell the dream of metabolic flexibility. Mm. Like I was just going to have to ditch all nuance, all, all variability. And, and, uh, you know, even, and, and this is an interesting thing too. I tend to feel better and do better in a ketogenic state Same. Or, or, you know, kind of a parent Absolutely. ketogenic state. Yeah. I am not particularly metabolically flexible. Like, I, I guess you could, like, if I'm doing some really hard jujitsu and I do some targeted carbs in and around the jujitsu, or I do some sort of like a CrossFit esque circuit, I can target some carbs in there. I definitely get a performance bump, but I've got to really target that, that stuff appropriately but I don't think I would define myself as being metabolically flexible the way that my wife is. And so, um, I'm not arguably that metabolically flexible. I've tried like crazy to achieve it. I've donated blood to reduce iron. I've done mm. like every prebiotic probiotic you can find in the results ranged from, uh, overtly negative, like making me feel worse, yeah, worse. to, yeah to, you know, it did nothing. Um, and so I, I finally just kind of abandoned it. And so it's this thing that I think metabolic flexibility, it's, it's kind of like being tall and good looking. It's like, everybody wants that, but I don't know that everybody gets that, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and, you know, if you're short and not that attractive, then I guess you could have your shins extended and, you know, you could get some plastic surgery and we'll, we'll, we'll tinker with it, you know, from, from there. And I kind of see that as like the nutritional and lifestyle interventions. There's things that you can do that may enhance metabolic flexibility. And I think that there's also just to some degree, some boundaries that I will never be as metabolically flexible as my wife. I don't know if I was ever as metabolically flexible as my wife, because looking back, uh, I, I found some medical records that my mom had gestational diabetes. So wow. maybe, and she had celiac and she had some autoimmune stuff and, and uh, gut issues. 
So my epigenetics may have been programmed in utero to not be all that met metabolically flexible. So wow. I don't know if I, I really answered the, you know, the, what about metabolic flexibility question? Like, I think it's a really cool concept. I, I think it's a, a laudable thing to have, but I also think it's kind of, it, I wouldn't say luck, but it's not something that we can just engineer a good outcome. Whereas absent that we can usually, I, I've seen other people too, um, they just do better on carbs and, and they yeah. need to eat more frequently. And we've tinkered with a little bit of fasting and we try to do some induction keto type stuff and they just don't do well with it. We get their electrolytes on point. We do everything that we need to do that, that should make them a fat burning machine. And it just doesn't really work that well for them. And so I would argue those folks are also probably not spectacularly metabolically flexible, but they seem to be metabolically healthy. They are not yeah. showing signs and symptoms of, of metabolic disease and, and, uh, and all that type of stuff. So it's another one of these things. And, you know, because it's so oblique, man, there's so many gold mines that can be sold at the, the end of the, the metabolic flexibility rainbow. Like there's all kinds of promise and all kinds oh, of yeah. cool shit. And if it doesn't work, it's probably your problem, not a failure yep. of the, of the concept. Yeah. 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 It's one of these things. I feel like that there's a lot of pressure kind of coming out for people to, Hey, you're not metabolically flexible because you haven't cheated on keto or haven't gone off of, you know, whatever you haven't gone off low carb in years. And so this is a failing of yours and you need to start working on this. And I think that that could be beneficial for some people perhaps, but then there's other people that, you know, perhaps eating sugar, eating carbohydrates that could cause them to revisit old eating disorders and, mm -hmm. and binging, you know, binge eating behavior. And so the whole topic of metabolic flexibility, it's definitely fascinating to me to understand kind of how it works and, you know, but I think that the pressure coming out, like it's the people that are against low carb and keto and carnivore that are really, right. really banging the drum loudly and saying, well, you guys would fail a glucose tolerance test. Um, and that's not good. And kind of just shaming people for wanting to just kind of stick with what they're doing. Yeah. And I mean, uh, uh in the flip side of that is uh, there are a lot of people, uh, that are higher carb that would fail a, a lipid clearing tolerance test where you feed them a high fat diet and they don't clear lipids efficiently, you know, and this is again, where I think that you have some people like my wife that are really like tri fuel engines, like you throw anything into them and they, it, it just comes out as energy and, and not a lot of, uh, you know, side issues with that. Um, not all hunter gatherers or pre-industrial people had great glucose tolerance tests. The people that ate a higher carb diet habitually typically had fantastic oral glucose tolerance tests. People like the, uh, uh, the, the son had pretty terrible glucose tolerance tests by comparison because they tended to eat a low carb diet. And even the, 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 the main papers that were done on these folks there, uh, the, for the son, their real, um, low carb period of the year is during the summer because the watering holes have, have dried up. Like the vegetable matter is skinny. And so right. it, the, the main food source left is, is animal products. So they tend to be much more in kind of a quasi keto or, you know, more carnivore centric period. And that is when the, these tests were performed on these folks. So, um, they were in a period of time where they were eating comparatively little carbohydrate. And so of course they're going to fail a oral glucose tolerance test. Um, there, uh, there's a great, uh, Lily Nichols, uh, mm -hmm. is a, a really wonderful person. Um, uh, pregnancy with whole foods, gestational diabetes with whole foods. And there are women who just feel good eating kind of a lower carb diet. Um, mm -hmm. they have good blood glucose response on that, but they would do really poorly on a, a oral glucose tolerance test. And so we find things like, well, lo let's look at A1C and or fructosamine, and let's use that as the surrogate of whether or not we're, we're facing, uh, uh, you know, gestational diabetes versus this kind of arbitrarily spun up test that they're, you know, it, it's designed for them to fail. Yeah. And then they're going to start eating in a way that they feel less well than what they did previously. Like it's, 
Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's where the evidence-based um, nutrition crowd is, is really kind of annoying. And I, I think injurious yeah. to folks because they, but, but then they're pushing back against the folks that say that having a piece of bacon is going to kill you because of the poofas in it. It's just like, right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You've got yeah. it's so many crazy camps. And yeah. I guess speaking of crazy camps, there's a really loud group of people now that, you know, a lot of them used to do carnivore and now they're, um, eating a lot of fruit, which is fine. You know, I'm the first person that's like, if you can tolerate fruit, if it works for you, cool, go for it. If you're, you know, super active, go for it. But they're basically saying, if you don't eat fruit, if you don't eat sugar, their whole thing is the glucose, the sugar, um, and just do carnivore that you're going to wreck your thyroid. Um, it's going to just basically like deteriorate your health, but their big thing is like, you're going to just completely decimate your thyroid. If you don't eat sugar as part of a regular part of your carnivore diet. And, uh, yeah, it's been <laughs> there. I've stayed out of it. I've just been kind of watching, you know, but, um, it's, there've been a lot of, uh, a lot of fighting going on in the community lately about that. I'm curious your thoughts on the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah. It, you know, during the summer, I definitely eat and seem to tolerate more fruit. Yeah. I have to be kind of careful what I do. Um, melons and citrus tend to be the things I do best on. Some berries I do okay. Uh, I, I think because of kind of FODMAP fructose type mm -hmm. issues, uh, apples and pears crush me. Like oh, I can wow. eat like apple sauce because it's cooked. If the pears get baked or something, then I, I can eat a little bit of them. But um, so even that, like I have a little bit of, you know, uh, specifics with it. And uh, again, like some parts of the year, I, I will do more. Um, if I have a really hard training day, I'll do more fruit that day. But the interesting thing is I can't really do it serially. I can't do it day after day. So I'll have kind of a higher carb day and then I'll kind of taper it back down. And then I have a hard training day and I'll, I'll taper things back down. And on that thyroid front, I really think a lot of what folks see there, whether it's, it's keto or carnivore, is that folks aren't getting enough sodium in their diet. And, mm -hmm. and when we have this very low insulin load environment, I don't, I don't know that the fruit, the sugar specifically is fixing the problem. I think the fruit, sugar, and insulin is causing the body to retain enough sodium so that we're not seeing that antagonistic action of cortisol against the thyroid, preventing the conversion of, of uh, T3, uh, T4 into T3 and, and getting reverse T3 building up and whatnot. Um, everything that I see there, people will say, well, that's a carb problem, but you could equally make the case it's an inadequate sodium problem. And one of the primary effects of eating more carbs is that we retain more sodium. So I would make the case that if uh, it, at a minimum, if folks are eating a very low carb diet of whatever flavor they got to be getting at least five grams of sodium per day from, from dietary and, and other sources. And then I, I don't see those same types of problems popping up and I would lean heavily just on what I see out of the keto gains community, because they have tens of thousands of people going through their program, just enormous throughput. Their main demographic is, is comprised of females, 35 to 60. So like, if you were going to see hormonal dysregulation, oh, thyroid issues, that is the demo. Like that yeah, is the demo. hundred percent. But they, you just don't see that because they pay as much neurotic attention to the uh, sodium and electrolyte intake as they do protein, carbs, fat. And mm -hmm. that, that was part of the reason why I really glommed onto those guys because I saw them doing some work that was really, really, really different. So I would make the case that, uh, while people are doing these pissing matches back and forth about carbs, no carbs, all that type of stuff that they would be better served, really making sure that they get their electrolytes on point. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, I have people that message me constantly about poor sleep and hair falling out and things like that. And I'm like, well, a few things, are you eating enough? Are you over exercising? Are you over fasting? Or are you just maybe to put fasting on the back burner, but how are you, what are you doing for electrolytes? You know, right. And most of the time, I would say nine times out of 10, those people say, I'm just salting my food to taste. Yeah. And it's I'm not like, remotely enough. Oh yeah. yeah. You got to do a lot more than that. And yeah. that was definitely a problem for me. I think even with just doing super high protein, it accelerated the dehydration, 
but I was extremely dehydrated um, just after just salting my food to taste for a year straight. And that was the only thing I did for electrolytes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, I agree with you completely. Well, I had 20 years of dealing with inadequate salt. So you, Oof. you got off easy. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> well, yeah. I feel like there's so much information out there now. I mean, I, this was 2019. And then if mm -hmm. you're doing it all those years ago, there's, there's like nothing out there at all um, as well, far as it, information goes. Yeah. And it, it's funny if one is placed on a medically supervised ketogenic diet, the dietitian is, it, it really, they put together a meal plan that will guarantee you get at least five grams of sodium per day. Uh -huh. And they also make sure that you, you know, if somebody's put on an epilepsy diet or like adjunctive cancer therapy or something, they want a, a certain ketogenic level, then the protein carbs fat are really important. But because they understand the nature of of fasting, that when insulin levels drop, that we tend to dump sodium. And then we get this kind of downward spiral where then we start dumping potassium and, and everything goes crazy. Um, they fix that by making sure by hook or by crook that you get adequate sodium. But in the pop culture of diet books, and I've written two of them that were New York times bestsellers. And I mentioned sodium, not once in either yeah. of those, you know, and if I could have been aware of this in the early two thousands, like one, my health would have been far better. My experience of life would have been far better. And I would have been in a position to help a hell of a lot more people versus waiting till 2016 ish in, in having sodium really get on my radar. Yeah. yeah. And it's in the presence of low insulin that we really need to be cognizant of the sodium intake, right? Yeah, more so. But you know, it's, it's interesting, even, uh, you know, just uh, high motor athletes like the American Council of Sports Medicine, they make the case that people who are training hard in hot or humid environments at altitude should be consuming uh, seven to 10 grams of wow. sodium per day. And that's within the framework that they're assuming these people are eating 600 grams of carbs per day. Wow. So it really, it, you know, it juxtaposes there possibly how far off we are on these, these, uh, kind of electrolyte recommendations and people will go down the rabbit hole and say, well, how did people get that much, you know, out of like an ancestral diet? And there, there's, I have different thoughts on that. And, and a lot of it boils down to, I think people drink fewer fluids in an yep. ancestral environment. Like they don't have one of, yeah, one of these I've... that, you know, that they're, they're <laughs> right, just chugging because, on. Right. Yeah. I think that that's a piece of it. And then on the exercise side, even though what we understand from hunter gatherer activity levels, they were active, but they didn't look remotely like a hard training athlete. Like mm. they did. And a lot of people, that's their outlet, that's their joy, that's great. But if you're going to push things above kind of super physiological levels, above what ancestral norms are kind of expecting, then we're going to have to buffer that with, with more electrolytes or different types of fueling and whatnot. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, uh, my husband actually was sick. We got the, you know what, but I haven't been talking about it on my platform because, you know, it's just not one of the things that you talk about, but, you know, besides lipop liposomal vitamin C and vitamin D and a bunch of other things, we, you had just sent me a bunch of these, got these right here now in the office because yeah. we love them so much. Um, got a bunch of LMNTs and I got my husband drinking those. And now he's, he's a car beater, but he jogs a lot. He's real tall. He's real in shape. He's probably in ketosis half the time. And he's just, mm -hmm. he can eat, you know, food and it just kind of melts off of him. I'm the, I'm the opposite. I'm the complete opposite, but he's, he's like, order some more of those. And so we've got boxes now of the LMNT um, and he loves them. And like, he's a complete car beater. Uh, most of my meals are pretty low carb, but he's, drinking his smoothies for breakfast, even though I'm right. completely against that. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think that there's benefit in that for, for everyone. And we're in Georgia too. So it's pretty, so it's pretty hot, hot, and humid. Yeah, hot and yeah. humid here. Yeah. yeah. It's like a swamp. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. 